So welcome to all you newcomers and all you faithful attenders. Glad to see your smiling faces. MCF is a nonprofit ministry that seeks to educate the public about the historical and scientific accuracy of the Bible, particularly the Genesis accounts of six-day creation as global floods. Ultimately, we want to encourage people to place their trust in the Creator Himself and in the Bible's message of salvation through Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. We're here to share a lot of evidence, but even as it was mentioned on the radio this afternoon, it's not the evidence. We're here to share evidence that helps you in your faith, in your walk with Christ, in your trust in the reliability of Scripture, but the bottom line is that relationship with the sovereign God of the universe. That's the, the message that we're here to present. But we enjoy sharing the science. Now this guy sitting over here, as long as he doesn't get too close to that speaker, <laughs> is Doc Rock. Dr. Andrew Snelling holds a PhD in geology from the University of Sydney, Australia. So you realize when he's standing here tonight, he's upside down. So he's talking upside down. So that's why you might have trouble hearing <laughs> and understanding what he's saying. But don't talk too fast tonight because this radiocarbon and radioisotopic dating stuff is all over my head. So make me understand. He serves as Answers in Genesis Director of Research and he's the editor-in-chief of the Online Answers Research Journal. That's free, it's online. If you go to Answers in Genesis website, click on Answers, there's two boxes underneath. One says Answers Magazine and one says Answers Research Journal. It's free, all the articles are there, you can pull up and read, you don't have to have a subscription. He's in charge of that. I also learned today, if you wanna make donations to Answers in Genesis and you mark them for research, they will go his department. He's the head of research. <laughs> Just a little tip on the side. Dr. Snelling is active in research and writes and also speaks on topics of the flood, fossils, and the Grand Canyon. You've seen these pictures of me in the Grand Canyon. He's led many. How many times have you been down through the Grand Canyon? Over 35. 35 trips. And they only allow people to go once a year. How do you get to go 35 times? Uh, because they put me down as crew for some trips. <laughs> so you're all interested in the subject of Uranium One, I'm sure. So tonight, Dr. Snelling is going to tell us all about Uranium, fatal flaws, and the radioacid topic dating. Well, it's good to be here with you and share with, share with you. We're st still... Ah, yes, good. Uh, I, I spent, as you saw, that was uh, 2014 on the trip that uh, Ken came with me and I had my second son and his wife, her father and my brother-in-law who's not a Christian and still isn't and also a friend from Adelaide. So it was, it was quite an Aussie trip. This year I've been down the canyon three times. The third trip was unexpected but it was a result of winning a lawsuit against the Grand Canyon National Park. And uh, we went in and collected the samples for that research that was finally permitted by the, the Canyon and uh, the Grand Canyon staff. And uh, the samples are with the laboratory at the moment and we're getting, getting together. And the, f the first evidence, the first results that are coming in, of course, are favourable to exactly what we expected. And we're not surprised. But tonight's topic is this question, flaws in the radioisotope dating methods. Now, um, I'm pretty sure that you'll all be able to grasp most of this tonight and at least get the take home at the end uh, as we get to the conclusions. But when it comes to the age of the earth, most people think that geologists have measured, measured the age of the earth with radioactive dating methods of earth rocks, on earth rocks, and therefore they've proven that the Earth is 4.57 billion years old. The interesting thing is the Earth's age was never, never derived on Earth rocks. Did you know that? It's not derived on Earth rocks. It came from the dating of meteorites. And, the, and here's the 1955, if any of you saw the Cosmos series with um, Neil deGrasse, um, he, he featured this uh, Claire Patterson at Caltech in 1955. This was where they took some meteorite date uh, samples, 
did the lead isotopes on them and, and derived this, this curve for the age of the Earth. Now, there's assumptions. You always have to ask yourself when someone makes a statement, what are the assumptions that they're using? And so the assumption here is that the meteorites rep the, represent the Earth when it's formed. It's based on assuming that the Earth and the solar system formed. Okay, sorry, the, the, solar, the Earth came out of the sun, of the solar nebula, um, which of course is an unbiblical assumption. It's based on an assumed evolutionary history. And, and, and therefore, and then it's used to prove that, evolu that evolutionary history, <coughs> okay? So it also assumes that the radioactive dating methods work accurately. <coughs> and that's the problem that we want to look at tonight. These radioactive dating methods, do they work accurately? Well, it works like this. You've heard of elements like carbon-14, but we're not going to talk about that so much tonight. We're going to talk about uranium and potassium that decay to uranium to lead. And there's two types of uranium. There's 238 and 235 uranium, and they decay to two types of lead. What happens is the nucleus has too many particles in it. So carbon-14 has 14 particles in its nucleus. Regular carbon has 12, only 12 in it. And because it's got too many particles in the nucleus, it becomes unstable. <laughs> And to get stable, it spits particles out of the nucleus to reduce its size. And that's what radioactive decay is. And it wants to get down to a, st a stable form. So that's the process of, of radioactive decay. And of course, the decaying atoms are called radioisotopes or radioactive isotopes. And uh, the, you've got the, uh, radioactive, these radioactive atoms of one element decay into stable atoms of a different element. So for example, you've got decaying atoms that are called radioisotopes. They're the parent atoms, another terminology, and the resultant stable atoms of a different element are the daughter atoms. So you've got parents decay to daughters. And minerals, rocks and fossils contain these radioactive parent atoms as well as daughter atoms. I mean, they're also they're present in fossils, uh, but the, these methods are not used directly on fossils. The ones that you're familiar with, as I said, carbon decays to nitrogen, which is regular nitrogen-14. Uranium-238 decays to lead-206. That second number is the size of the nucleus. Uranium is element number 92, but it's got... 230, 238 particles in its nucleus, or 235 in its nucleus, and it decays to lead 206 and lead 207. Potassium to argon, rubidium to strontium, and samarium to neodymium. Now, you might not have heard of those ones. They're rare earth elements, but neodymium is actually a very important metal. You know why? It's, it's important for wind turbines, because neodymium a dose of neodymium in the magnet gives you a better production of electricity. So it's one of those rare metals that's in high demand at the moment for alternative uh, energy uh, production. So a rock is chemically tested for these parent and daughter isotopes. In other words, they do a chemical analysis, okay? But then that chemical analysis has to be interpreted. And that's important to remember. And there's assumptions involved. If the rate of decay has remained constant at today's measured rate, okay, then it, you can calculate how long it has taken for the measured amount of daughter atoms to accumulate. Okay? So let me give you an illustration so you understand. Okay? Here's an hourglass clock. Okay, imagine all the sand grains at the top, they're red atoms, they're red, red sand grains, they're the parent atoms. With time, they fall, which is analogous to radioactive decay, and they get to the bottom and they're green atoms, or, or, or green sand grains, the daughter atoms. Okay, so if you have no, if you start with your rock with none of that, that's the assumption. Today we measure how much is in here, if you know the rate of falling, you can back calculate how long ago all these were back up there. 
Okay, uh, let me illustrate it another way. You use one of these in the kitchen, ladies, and it's rated for one hour. You can check it, of course, because you've got an external clock that you can check that it's, it takes one hour for all the sand grains to fall from the top to the bottom, okay? So you start it, you put a cake in the oven, and you start it off, and you go out to the, do the laundry, and you come back in, and you look, at that clock, you look at that clock and you see, oh, you do a measurement. Half the grains are at the bottom, half the grains at the top. Now, if it takes an hour for the wall to fall to the bottom, how long have you been out in the laundry, doing the laundry? 30 minutes, half the time. So, so you, did, you did a chemical analysis, you, you measured ha how much it was daughter, how much was still their parent, you knew the rate at which it fell, and so you back calculated, ah, oh, half, well, half the time for the whole lot, that's 30 minutes. And it's really that simple with regard to a rock. But as I said, there's assumptions involved. So we start with all the sand grains in the top bowl. It takes one hour for all the red grains to fall to the bottom as green sand grains. And so a rock is chemically tested for these red and green atoms, these parent and daughter atoms, okay? And just get that in your mind. That's what they do. They do a chemical analysis. And there's nothing wrong with the chemical analysis. You can send the same samples to different laboratories and you'll invariably get the same results. The rate of radioactive decay is the falling, and uh, we can measure the rate today, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, how it's done and the problems. So you then calculate how long it has taken the measured amount of green atoms to accumulate from the red atoms. That's how long the hourglass has been operating, which is the age of your rock, if, if you're looking at it in terms of a rock. So that's the concept. Now, if you've grasped that already, you're well on the way to, to understanding these methods because it's as simple as all that. But here's the problem. You have to have three crucial assumptions with, for this to operate. Now, if it's true with an hourglass clock, it's even more true and more critical with these radioactive dating methods. There are three crucial assumptions and I want to go through these. Now, if this is all that you grasp tonight, you're 95% of the way to demolishing arguments about these dating methods. Now, I'm serious because we can demonstrate these problems are prolific. Assumption number one, the amounts of parent and daughter atoms at the beginning when the rock formed, that is the initial conditions must be known. Well, you were in your kitchen and you put all the sand grains up the top, so when you left to do the laundry, you knew that there were no green ones at the bottom. But wait a minute, we're talking about a rock that supposedly formed millions of years ago, okay? And there were no green atoms in the bottom. That's the assumption that the geologist makes, that there were none at the beginning, or if there were, we, know how, we can figure out how, many, how much there was. Because if you don't know the initial conditions, then you've got a problem. And that requires an observer. How many scientists were there when the rocks formed? to check the rocks when they formed? None. And, and we can show you examples that are recognised in the literature where recent lava flows have been dated and they already have some of these daughter atoms in them. And we'll come to that in a minute. Assumption number two, all the daughter atoms measured today must only have been derived by in situ radioactive decay of parent atoms. In other words, you have to have a closed system. It has to be no contamination. All the green atoms must have come from falling from red atoms. In other words, ladies, while you're out of the kitchen, your mischievous 10-year-old son didn't sneak into the kitchen, lift up the lid and put some more red, red atoms in the top. Because you know what? If he did that and you came back and looked half and half, you'd get the wrong answer, wouldn't you? There were more red atoms that he put in there to contaminate the system. In actual fact, your cake's been in the others for 40 minutes and you think it's only 30, so you're going to burn it. You get the point? Now, well, the rocks have supposedly been out there for millions and billions of years. Have scientists been there for all those years to test to see that there's been no contamination? Now, most of you won't have the opportunity to go down a mine down a, a mine shaft, down into the earth where they're dug into the ground. But it will surprise you that the effects of weathering, weathering, 
with groundwaters that have oxygen in them can go down as much as a mile. And where are they collecting the samples from for dating? Usually at the surface, where you've got the most probability of contamination. Rain falls on the rocks, oxygen in the atmosphere, uh, you know, you get a bit of pollution, you've got acid rain, and acidic, ground, acidic rainfall will dissolve some of these elements. So there's no way that you can be certain that, that this is uh, being uncontaminated. And then you have to assume that the rate of falling or the measured, uh, the decay rate has been the same through the past history of the rock as what we measure today. And so the rate at which the red atoms fall to produce the green mass must have been constant at today's measured rate. But that also requires observers. Have the scientists been there for millions of years testing that these are, that clocks are, are, are ticking at the same rate all the time through all those millions of years? No. You know, it's like if your mischievous son lifted up the lid and put some drops of water in the sand grains, what would that do? The sand grains wouldn't fall so quickly and your calculations are going to be out. So, so they can't, they, they have to assume that the rate has been constant, but they have no way of testing it. So you see, here's the three assumptions. All the daughter atoms derived from the parent atoms, no initial inheritance, no other process has affected the daughter-parent relationship, there's been no contamination, and constant decay rates, no changed rates in the past. Well, none of these assumptions are provable. The past cannot be observed and measured and tested. So these assumptions are not even reasonable. Based on our everyday experience, these are unreasonable assumptions. Even the assumption of decay rates being constant. From a biblical perspective, there was an event called the flood when geological processes were at catastrophic rates. So could radioactive decay have been speeded up back then? Yes. And the interesting thing is all three assumptions have been repeatedly falsified. Particularly the first two have been falsified in their own literature. You can go to the standard textbooks used in all the major universities around the world to teach this subject and they will document the scientific studies that show the problems with contamination and initial inheritance. So they know it. So the daughter atoms are known to be inherited when the rocks form, <coughs> but even when they're not detected, it doesn't mean there hasn't been inheritance. Okay, they, they know from their studies when they can show there's inheritance, but what about the other rocks where they've got no other clues as to whether it was, in, maybe, maybe all the daughter atom was inherited. And what about, so that assumption number one is often violated. Contamination, subsequent contamination is common and even if it isn't detected doesn't mean that it isn't present. You can have a nice straight line in an isochron, which is their technique for multiple samples and if they all line up on a straight line that's supposed to be a good result, but they could also be a mixing. With, there's examples in the literature where contamination will produce a nice straight line. So even if you get a nice straight line, doesn't mean that it's a, 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 a true result. And so contamination is often present. And there's several lines of evidence I'm going to touch on tonight briefly that shows that decay rates were grossly accelerated in a recent past catastrophic event, the flood. No change rates, therefore, is violated by demonstrated past accelerated decay. Now, as I said, the quality of the chemical analysis I'm not disputing, since they can be repeatedly confirmed. What we are disputing is the interpretations of those chemical analyses in terms of millions of years, based on these three unprovable, repeatedly falsified assumptions. Now, if you've grasped all that, you're well ahead in understanding how you can demolish the, the arguments. Let me give you some examples. Let's go to the Grand Canyon of all places. Wonder why we picked the Grand Canyon. Well, people, that's a question that I often get asked. But the point is the Grand Canyon is a mecca for geologists. Why? Because you've got a desert out there so the biology doesn't cover up the geology. And 
you've got exposed to view. You can walk from the bottom of the Grand Canyon to the top, and then you can go further to the north up a series of, st of steps or cliffs, and you can see a huge transect that covers most of recorded Earth history. And so it, it's a great place to study. Well, there's two, la two different lava flows in the Grand Canyon. There's some that are right down there the bottom. See those tilted layers? They go back to before the flood in a biblical time frame. And even the geologists say that those are really, really old. And uh, you know, they're supposed to be a billion years old or more. And then you've got these recent lava flows, the Uruguay Plateau basalt lava flows. You can actually see some of the craters that are still there. And you can see the lava flow, the lava's flowed over the walls of the canyon, so it was after the canyon was carved. In fact, some of the last of these eruptions were possibly seen by the Native Americans. They're that recent. And so here's a photograph looking. You can see one of these uh, volcanoes. And uh, down the bottom there, you can see the river. Right at that point is the fastest navigable rapid in North America. It's the granddaddy of the rapids in the Grand Canyon. And I've been over it when it's almost been impossible, the, the roar of the water. Here's the ancient lava flows at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, the Cardenas Basalt. So get, in, get your head in your, around the fact that these two lava flows are separated by those horizontal layers from our perspective, they represent the flood. From the, from the conventional wisdom, they represent 250 million years of slow and gradual accumulation of these layers. The first one is supposed to be half a billion, the tapetes at the bottom is supposed to be over half a billion years old. And the Cardenas basalt is supposed to be over billions of years, a billion years old, at least. Well, what results do we get using rubidium dystrontium we get essentially the same age within the error margins. Notice that. The bottom one comes in at where they reckon it should, about 1.1 billion years, but the youngest lava flow in the Grand Canyon, lava flows give you the same rubidium strontium age as the ancient lava flows. That tells you there's something wrong with the method, doesn't it? Can you figure out why? Well. How could the youngest lava flows at the top of the canyon yield the same old rubidium strontium as some of the oldest lavas down at the bottom? The answer is these lavas came from the same source. Down below the Grand Canyon from the mantle, which is the section after that you've got the outer skin of the earth, it's called the crust, underneath that is the mantle, and that's where basalts are generated by melting down there. So these ages can't be real ages, but represent the same chemistry from the same source. So that immediately tells you, <coughs> if we have a tester case <coughs> where we can show that the method fails because the young lava flow has inherited the same source as the ancient one, how do we know that all the other ancient lava flows that have been dated with this method isn't also as a result of the chemistry of the source and have nothing to do with the age? See, that's the, you've got to remember the logic. They can't, they can't just say, oh, well, it doesn't work for that one example. Well, how do you know it's not working for every other example? Let's look at the Cardenas basalt again. <coughs> this is down at the bottom of the canyon. <clears throat> this is what you can see from the eastern Grand Canyon from near Desert View Tower. You can see this is the bottom layer of the flood sequence, the Tapit sandstone. This is in this, there's layers there. Here they are, again, there's something like five or six lava flows, major lava flows. Here's the boundary between two of those flows. And uh, they've been dated by several methods. In fact, one of the things that Steve Austin there and I did is we sent the same samples to different laboratories for the different methods because we want to see if you get the same results on the same rocks. Because the textbooks say it doesn't matter which method you use. Think about it. The lava forms and it's got these elements in it. Once it forms, the clocks start ticking. We now measure them today so those clocks have ticked all through the same real time period between when the rock formed and today. So if they all started ticking at the same time 
and tick through the same period, they should all give you the same age. That's what the textbooks say. Well, what results did we get? By the potassium argon A method, 516 million years, rubidium strontium 1,111 million years, samarium nidine 1,588 million years. Which is the correct age? Maybe it's D, none of the above. How would you know if there was a, without an observer? <coughs> and notice how, how accurate these are in replicating the same age. The rubidium strontium age is twice the size of the potassium argon age, the samaritan age is three times. So how can we reconcile them? This is just one example. We did four such studies in the Grand Canyon and came out with the same spread of results. And there was a distinctive pattern which told us, <coughs> which told us there was something systematic going on. Okay? <coughs> so if these radioactive clocks were accurate, <coughs> always ticking at the same rates as measured today, each clock should have given the same age. Therefore, the different ages must mean that the clocks must have been ticking at different, faster rates than today. How do I know that? Well, remember, they started ticking when the rock formed and they've ticked through the same real-time period to the present day. So... During that real time period, the potassium argon clock ticked rapidly through 516 million years, but the rubidium clocks ticked twice as fast at 1,111 million years worth of ticks, and the Samaria neodymium clock ticked three times as quickly as the rate measured today. See, those ages that were derived are based on assuming the decay rate has been the same as what we measure today. So this tells you that the decay rate was different in the past and it had to be faster in the past. That's the only way you can reconcile these clocks because they've all ticked through the real time period from in the rock form to the present day. And so we, we found this, the different ages can be explained if these clocks ticked at faster rates in the past, at different faster rates than today's slow measured rates. So radioisotope data cannot yield the claimed absolute ages of millions of years. If you're not sure how fast the clock's ticked, then you've got a real problem. And we replicated this, not just with one study, but we did four studies in the canyon. And there's hints of it with other, in the literature, in their own literature, of the same sort of patterns. And more work needs to be done, more research needs to be done in the literature to replicate this from their own literature. But I want to go further than that tonight, just to remind you, these assumptions again, assumption one violated by inheritance, assumption number two violated by contamination and assumption number three violated by accelerated decay rates. Now, here's the question. But the evolutionary scientific community simply ignores these problems with these assumptions. <coughs> this is primarily because they've convinced themselves that the isochron technique eliminates the need to know the initial conditions and supposedly indicate contamination when samples do not plot on the isochrons. That was those straight lines. See, normally they'll take one sample of a rock and measure the parent and daughter atoms and then do the calculations of the age. The isochron techniques, they take four, five, six, seven samples, analyse for the red and the the, 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 the red and the green atoms, the parent and daughter atoms, and then they plot on a, on a graph red atoms versus green atoms, and if the, the, the dots, because you see if there's more parents, there should be more daughter, because more atoms have been able to decay in the same time period. So if you've got different amounts of parents in the rock, you'll have different amounts of daughter if they've all decayed at the same time rate and given you the, through the same time period, so you'll have a straight line. And they call that the isochron. Iso means same chron age. Now, the reason they assume that that works is because after all, it gives them the required millions of billions of years for evolution. And usually in the right order upwards in the rock record. You see, evolution is <coughs> sacrosanct. Without the millions of years, there's no time for evolution. That's why the age of the Earth is the crucial issue. 
if you stop to think about it. If there aren't millions of years, then there's no time for evolution to occur. And also, by the way, it brings God closer to reality to the present day. If the earth is billions of years old, you can push him out of the picture and he be, supposedly becomes irrelevant to the here and now. And that's what frightens people. If, you're, if you say the earth is young and the Bible is right after all, ultimately, as I said today on the radio, it's a spiritual issue. It really is. Now, I want to I cover how reliable and objective are the measured decay rates to calculate these great ages. Because, see, what I wanted to find out was have they really accurately determined the present rate of decay? And I was surprised when I went back into the literature. There's two parameters that are used to measure the decay rate. The one that most people are familiar with is called the half-life. Now, what it means, if you start with, say, a pound of uranium, after one half-life, you have one pound left, half a pound left. It's the time... It's the time it takes for half a given quantity to decay away. So you'll have half a pound of uranium and half a pound of lead after one half-life. So in the second half-life, that half a pound of lead decays to a quarter of a pound. So you get smaller and smaller amounts as it decays away. And there are three methods that they've used to, to measure this in the laboratory, and it's not that hard. First of all, the direct counting so in other words, you put a Geiger counter in front of uranium and you count the number of ticks. Every tick represents a uranium atom that decayed. Or, or measure the ingrowth daughter. What does that mean? Well, you get the uranium sitting there and after a certain period of time, you measure how much lead's in it. And you assume that it's come from the uranium and so you can figure out how many, how many lead atoms will tell you how many uranium atoms have decayed. And then the other method that they've used, which is a sleight of hand, we'll come to that in a moment, is comparison of radioisotope ages on the same rocks or minerals or meteorites. In other words, they say, the textbooks say you should get the same age, therefore you should have the same, uh, they should have the, the rate of decay, should give, make it sure that we give the same age. And so we, and I'll come back to this in a moment, how it's done, but they compare radioisotope, ages from different methods on the same rock. And I'll, show, I'll illustrate this for you so you grasp it. Okay, direct counting. A sample is prepared with a known amount of parent radioisotope. And we can do that because chemists know there's a famous number called Avogadro's number. It's the number of atoms in a mole, M-O-L-E, not in a, a mole that digs in the ground, a mole of the element. And it's, ten, it's six times 10 to the 23, isn't it, Ken? So, so if you know you've got one mole of uranium, then you'll have that many number of atoms, okay? And so you can then put that in front of your detector. Every one of those counts is an atom decaying. You know how many you started with? You know how many have been counted by the detector over, say, a period of one year? Maybe you, you get... 10,000 counts, so you know that 10,000 of those 10, 6 times 10 to the 23 atoms have decayed in one year, so you can calculate the rate of decay. It, it's, it's not that difficult to do in one, it sounds easy, but it, it, it's harder than that. Why? Well, you think about it. <coughs> You've got this lump of uranium and these particles are coming off. What's going to happen? They've got to get out of that sample before they get to your detector. What happens if some of them bounce off some of the other atoms and get pushed out this way instead of out to your detector? They're going to get scattered or they're going to stop inside that lump of uranium and not make their way out. So in other words, you're going to miss some of the counts. And then every time your detector is measuring, what happens? It processes it electronically and while it's processing it, it's what we call the dead time. While it's processing it, it can't detect the next one that comes in. So you're going to lose some counts like that. And so there's those problems that, that make direct counting not exactly accurate as you'd like it to be. Well, how does ingrowth measuring work? Well, they get a sample of pure parent element and it must not have any daughter atoms in it to begin with. And then you allow the parent radioisotope atoms to decay over, say, a period of time like a year. 
and then you, you measure the amount of daughter atoms that you've got in your sample. And so you know how many daughter atoms were produced in that year. So you can back calculate how fast they turned it from the parents into daughter. What's the problems there? Well, you have to know that you've got a pure sample for, to start with. So you've got to have good analytical equipment. You've got to make sure you've got a pure element. And it's, that, that's easier said than done. You've got to be sure of the isotopic composition of the pure element sample. So the number of parent atoms are accurately known. And then you've got to be sure of the purity of what you put when you, when you measure the daughter atoms. You've got to take a piece of that sample, you've got to process it to put it in the mass spectrometer. You put it on a filament, like an electric bulb filament, okay, and you turn it on, it heats it up so that it vaporises it and it gets drawn through the magnets in the mass spectrometer to measure the daughter atoms. Well, you've got to make sure you've got it, got it right on the filament. Otherwise, if you've got contamination there, and then you've got the counting efficiency of the electronics in the, in the mass spectrometer. So, again, it's not that simple. That's why they've increasingly turned to comparing radioisotope ages. How do they do that? Well, they have samples of the same rock unit are dated by, isochron dated by two different methods. It's, it's supposed to yield the same radioisotron, radioisotope isochron ages for this rock unit. But if they disagree, what do they do? Well, they adjust the half-life of one of the decaying atoms so that their, that age then corresponds to the age derived by the decay of the other parent atom. And the reference radioisotope method is always the uranium lead method. So, for example, if they're comparing rubidium decaying a rubidium age with a uranium age and they disagree, then they've calculated the rubidium age based on a certain decay rate that they've measured in the laboratory by other methods, but it doesn't agree with the uranium age. Ah, oh, well, we must have got it wrong in the laboratory. So let's tweak the, the calculated decay rate that we're going to use now for this age to make the rubidium age agree with the uranium age, and now we'll call that the new decay rate for rubidium. Is that objective or what? Okay. It is assumed that both methods used have accurately dated the rock, and it's assumed that both radioisotope systems closed thermally at the same time. What do I mean by that? Well, you've got a lava flow that cools. While it's warm, these atoms can move around and, and from mineral to mineral and even out of the rock. And so when they get to a certain temperature, they're locked in and then they can decay away. But if they're not locked in at the same time at the same temperature, one could be floating around for a lot longer and, and that will affect the, the comparison. It's also assumed that the lead lead age is the gold standard as close as possible, but that assumes the uranium decay rates are known accurately and also, more importantly, the ratio between uranium-238 and 235 is constant. The reason why it is a constant, and we know that, the reason I say that is because the lead-lead age, I should explain to you, you've got uranium decays to lead, you've got two types of uranium decaying to two types of lead. The gold standard is comparing the two leads, okay? So you have to assume that you know the amounts of uranium to start with. A natural uranium has a certain amount of 235 and 238. So the, the ratio is supposed to be constant in nature. If it's not constant, how can you compare the two leads at the end to get you this gold standard age that they use? <clears throat> and up until recently, it was assumed that the uranium-238-35 ratio was a constant, and we'll come to that in a moment. Let's quickly scroll through some of these methods. The potassium-40 half-life. The potassium decays to argon, but approximately only 10%, 10.5% decay to argon. 
89.5% actually decay to calcium. So they, it branches, okay? And so you've got to know that that's accurately happening. The half-life is expressed as the total of all the component half-lives, and it's said to be over 1.24 billion, uh, 248 billion years. But the term and determination that over the last 70 years have di used direct counting and comparison of radioisotope ages. But here's the results in the last 70 years. Notice there's a gap there between 1945 and 1980, except one, there were, uh, except one were uh, direct counting and produced scatter results. Then there were no determinations between 1980 and 1995. And between 1995 and 2000, there have been only comparisons, basically comparisons of primarily direct comparisons of the age. Geological comparisons is the radioisotopes ages being compared. And that's been the predominant method that they've used. So notice there was a gap, but early, early results and if, if you really took all those results... As, now, one thing I, I point out to people, you know, they say, oh, but the early results were, you know, the equipment wasn't as, as good as what we have today. We'll, 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 we'll wait a minute. They didn't have computers back then. So the experimenter was closer to the equipment, was hands-on. People who use computers today don't necessarily understand the measuring equipment because they're relying on their computers to run their equipment. Are they, are they as hands-on with their equipment that's doing the measuring? Usually not. They're relying on their computers that they hope they've programmed correctly to run the equipment, like the mass spectrometers. So it's easy, to, on the one hand, to dismiss the early results, but on the other hand, we shouldn't do that. And you'll notice that, in actual fact, there's a trend in those results. They're not all constant. In fact, you had a, a, a slower rate that, that <laughs> you've got a longer half-life to begin with that's, that's decreased. So even though the clustering... <coughs> but even the clustering between 1995 and 2015 does not provide a definitive half-life. This is because there are two major uncertainties that plague all efforts to precisely determine the, the potassium half-life. Again, notice down here there is still some variation, the, those far ones, okay? And these two uncertainties are the natural abundance of potassium-40, which isn't as well known as you might think. There's other isotopes of potassium. The branching ratio is the other problem. If they don't know that accurately, then, then you've got a problem. So ultimately, there's been increasing dependence on calibrating the potassium half-life against the lead-lead or uranium-lead dating of the same rocks and minerals. There is still some, therefore, there's still some uncertainty as to what today's potassium half-life value should be because the uranium-lead dating method isn't as objective comparing it. The half-life of potassium is anchored to assume we know the uranium decay rates and again the, cre cre the crucial uranium-238-235 ratio. So that doesn't give you much hope for the accuracy of potassium argon and argon dating at all. What about rubidium? Half-life is larger, 48.8 billion years. Determinations over the last 60 years have been use direct counting in growth and comparison of radioisotope ages techniques. Here's the scatter. Notice since 1970, there seems to have been some continuity down there. Uh, but most of the measurements down there from 1970 onwards have been primarily by comparison of dating. In other words, where they've compared it against uranium lead and tweaked the rubidium so it agrees with the lead. So the 1945 to 1970 were primarily by direct counting and produced scattered results. From 1970 to 2015, determinations were primarily by comparison of radioisotope ages and pro provided similar results. So I just pointed that out. There's the dividing line, 1970. We've got scatter. Since then, we've got no scatter. And that's why, the reason is because of this comparison of methods. 
The interesting thing, in the last decade, it has been noticed that there are two groupings of determination results. Group one consists of half-life determines on earth materials and on meteorites and lunar rocks, while group two is only half-lives determined on earth materials. So when they're plotted like this, they actually found that there's two different decay rates determined by these two groupings of samples. Such groupings can only be sustained if precedent is given to the half-life determinations compa by comparisons with the lead light, lead ages. But if the recent, most recent direct counting in-growth determinations are given the emphasis they should be, then in fact you get an entirely different half-life. You should get a, one that's different from these two groupings. And, and you can see over there, 2003 and 2012, by direct counting and by in-growth experiments, you actually get results that are distinctly different from either group one or group two. So, has the decay rate for rubidium been finally determined? No. There's still a lot of uncertainty in the literature as to today's value. Thus, the currently recommended value is primarily based on subjective recalibration of the half-life against the lead-lead isochron method. So, the, the rubidium half-life is only as good as the uranium half-life, assuming we know that the uranium decay rates and we know that crucial uranium-238-235 ratio. And yet the most recent hands-on direct counting and in-growth determinations suggest a different half-life value. So, if you don't know the decay rate, how accurate is the method? Not very accurate at all. What about Samaria? Again, you'll see the same pattern. Um, the half-life is supposed to be 106 billion years. Determination over the last 80 years have used the direct counting and comparison of radioisotope ages techniques. Okay? The 1935 to 1970 determinations were all by direct counting. And then apart from one determination, the data points to a steady decrease in the half-life, apparently due to improving technology allowing for improved precision. So, you know, you've got this trend like that. But then after 1970, you've, you've got a lot of the, the ones that are the same except for two outliers there, which are interesting. Those two outliers are the ones that are by direct experiment all these others are by comparison of the dating of the uh, geological comparisons. No, sorry, there's two there and there's others that, that have been done. So, by the early 1970s, the weighted average of four direct counting determinations in between 1961 and 1970 had established the half-life at 106 billion years. The 1970 to 2015 determinations have tended to yield similar results close to the recommended half-life, apart from two direct counting measurements, okay? There they are, those two direct counting measurements. But what happened in the mid-1970s, they did a comparison of the Sumerian neodymium ages with two meteorites with their lead-lead ages, and from then on, once they did that one comparison between the meteor two meteorites with the two meteorites, the value for the Sumerian half-life has not changed. Yet, those two direct counting method determinations have been totally ignored. In the 2003 experiment, they used multiple repeated measurements with multiple Sumerian sources using two different direct counting instruments. They did a detailed analysis of the counting efficiency of the in in instruments. So it was the most thorough experiment possible, and yet it gave a different re result. So it's been ignored because it disagrees with what they got on those two meteorites comparing with the lead lead. So the recommended half-life is firmly subjectively re re recalibrated against lead lead dating on two meteorites. Again, that means that it relies on whether we know the uranium decay rate accurately and whether the, the crucial 238-235 ratio is well known, accurate. And so, um, 
The problem is that the uranium decay rates and this crucial ratio are both increasingly in question as uncertain and variable, as we'll see in a moment. So there is still uncertainty as to what today's samarium half-life value should be because the uranium lead method comparison technique is not objective. And so, you know, and the definitive determination by the most thorough series of recent counting measurements has been ignored. So samarium neodymium cannot give you accurate ages then. What about uranium? Because it all hinges on uranium. And this is where the story gets even more interesting. Okay, so in nature, uranium-238 is 99.27% of a lump of natural uranium. 235 is the one they want for a nuclear bomb. And that's why they have to enrich the uranium with more, have to take out some of the 238 atoms, so they've got a higher amount of 235 atoms. That's what they mean by enriched uranium. Now, determinations over the last 85 years have primarily used a direct counting technique. Between 1930 and 1980, there were scattered results, potentially due to the early equipment of use. So here you can see the 238 scattered results, early results, increasingly, increasingly close to the same mark. That's 238. Here's 235. Scattered results. And then since 1980, closer to the mark. Appar apparently, according to their geological comparisons, which I'll come to in a minute. So, determinations since 1980, apart from one direct counting measurement of uranium-238, have tended to closely agree with one another. But there's a reason why that's the case. How have they done it? Well, they've assumed that the uranium-238 is the accurate determination, and they recalibrate the 235 so that it matches, the decay rate matches, so that the uranium-238 age is the same as the uranium, the 235 age is the same as the uranium-238 age. So again, they're doing some, this sort of massaging, tweaking, so that they get agreement. They're not grasping that the disagreement will tell you that there's something fundamentally wrong that they don't know about these uh, decay rates. Since since 2000, there's increasing reliance on using comparison of the uranium lead ages on the same minerals. That is, the uranium-238 to lead and the uranium-235 to lead, as I just said a moment ago. And, and so they adjust, they adjust the 235 decay rate so that the 235 age matches the 238 age. But again, where's, where's, the, where's the objectiveness of that? And that's why they're getting this sort of agreement down here because they're massaging the results to get them close to one another. So the currently recommended half-life values are there. Uranium-238, 4.4683 billion years. Uranium-235, 203.05 million years. A lot faster. However, the continued uncertainties in these half-life values still produce significant errors in the ages calculated from them. Here's a, this came out of the literature. Errors of between four and nine million years for only for the uncertainties in the uranium half-lives. So you can get quite a significant error in there. And you might say, well, if a sample's a billion years old and it's nine million years out, well, that doesn't sound like a huge amount, but it's still significant. And they, they don't like that. They want to get the errors down. But the optimal lead-lead ages, that is where you take the, compare the two lead end members, you have to rely on the uranium-238-35 ratio being constant. Okay? Until recently it had been determined as 137.88. That is the ratio between the abundance of 238 and 235 gives you that ratio. So what it was at 97.2, uh, 99.3, uh, whatever it was, by point... 28. Yeah, it's that ratio, okay? But very recent measurements have found great variance in this ratio in meteorites, rocks, minerals and uranium ores, which requires significant adjustment to the calculated lead-lead ages. So... Here's the uranium-235-238 values 
for minerals in earth rocks. Now the interesting thing is, all of these are the mineral zircon, which is supposed to be the gold standard in uranium lead dating. Lead, lead, uranium lead dating. But notice, zircons from different rocks give you diff have different ratios. So if you assume that the ratio was constant, you're going to have this, and not take into account this variation, you're going to get significantly imprecise uranium lead ages. And uh, this is for meteorites. Again, there's a huge variation. And uh, you might say, well, it's not a, not a, doesn't look significant. But when you factor it into the calculations of the ages, it's quite significant, in fact. Here's some all different materials. This is modern um, rivers, lake waters, rocks, coals, or uh, soils. See the variation, the soils here. Look at the variation in intrusive rocks, that's granites, effusive rocks, that's basalts that erupt from volcanoes. Look at the, look at the variation. Uh, clays, oysters, um, and so you can see there's a lot of variation in modern rocks and also in, in past rocks from different levels in the geologic record. So, until these uncertainties can be resolved, the resultant uranium lead, 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 lead ages will never be certain. But the evidence now shows that the ratio, the crucial ratio, will always be different for different rocks, minerals and meteorites. Even minerals, different minerals in the same rock will give you different uranium 238-235 ratios. So, that means the result in uranium lead and lead ages will never be certain. And so that means the, these methods are not accurate if we don't know these crucial ratios. That means all the other radioactive half-lives calibrated against these uranium half-lives and the lead, uranium lead and lead lead ages will never be certain. So that wipes out the accuracy of all these dating methods. Just a couple of conclusions here to sum up. Notice this is from the literature itself. This is recognised. The potassium half-life is ultimately calibrated against standard samples of known lead-lead ages. The rubidium half-life is ultimately calibrated against lead-lead ages on the same samples. And there's the references in the literature. It's not me making it up. They've docked that. This is straight out of the scientific literature. The samarium half-life is ultimately calibrated against lead-lead ages on the same samples, going back to 19, in the mid-1970s. So all the radioisotope dating methods are effectively calibrated against lead-lead ages of earth rocks, minerals and meteorites. But, as I said before, there is uncertainty about that crucial 238-235 ratio, as well as small uh, as small uh, consistent differences have been measured in all minerals and rocks. And there's the reference <coughs> for one of those diagrams, two of those diagrams I showed you. And there's also residual uncertainties about the measurements of the 238 and 235 decay rates. And there's a reference to it. So that's, that's out of their own literature, their own admissions. Do you think they tell this to the general public? Not even the geologists who rely on these scientists to do this dating know these things, let alone the general public. So these two problems make lead lead ages subject to large uncertainties. And if that's the gold standard, that means all the dating methods are subject to the same uncertainties. If the decay rates are not certain, then neither are the radioisotope ages calculated using them. As we before, sir, before, before, we also have to take into account inheritance, contamination and non-constant de decay rates. Those three assumptions that we talked about at the beginning, we've shown that they can be violated. That means, therefore, when you add all that up, the decay rates are not accurately known anyway. Then we've, we've found that all the methods, therefore, are totally unreliable and unusable. Therefore, radioactive dating cannot be provide absolute ages for rocks and minerals. And the age of the Earth, therefore, remember, was determined by assuming an unobserved evolutionary history. 
that is contrary to God's word. The explicit statement of scripture was that the earth was created on day one, the sun was created on day four. What does the scientific community say? The sun came first and the earth evolved out of the sun. Okay? So that's the underlying assumption that governs the whole dating of the earth by these methods. So in other words, we know because it directly violates scripture that it has to be wrong. So why should the observations of the world around us by finite, fallible, form and hu formal, fallible fallen humans be interpreted by, them based, interpreted by them based on the assumptions that reject the authority of Scripture be given precedence over the clear, God-breathed statements of Scripture? See, that's why I have a problem with Christian leaders and theologians that bow at the altar of scientists. These scientists reject the authority of Scripture and yet you've got so many Christian leaders and theologians who worship the results that these scientists produce. But they're based on rejecting the scriptures that the, the Christian leaders and theologians are supposed to uphold. You see I get emotional about it? For, for good reason. These guys are shooting their own feet from out under themselves. And they wonder why the general public is rejecting the Christian gospel. Our only certainty is the God-breathed eyewitness account in the scriptures of the earth's origin and age and history. Now, implications, and I'll be very brief with this, but uh, one, of the, one of the leaders uh, tomorrow night asked me to deal with this and so I've added it in for tomorrow night, but you get the benefit of it as well. People say, but look, don't, don't the rocks still give you ages of millions of years in the right order? Therefore, the methods must work. But see, many of the sources of errors that grossly inflate the radioisotope ages are systematic. They use the same faulty decay half-life to calculate all those ages, so that's systematic. The same errors for determining the half-life are systematic. The inheritance could be systematic. The contamination could be systematic. Thus, the result in age, on the one hand, the resultant ages are unreliable and highly inflated compared to the 6,000-year biblical time frame. However, they still usually match the relative order because they can be used as relative ages of the rock units. And I'll illustrate for you this in a moment, why I'm saying this. Many of the accepted radioisotope ages do, in fact, match the relative order of the strata and their relative ages. In other words, the rocks that are down the bottom give you older ages, the ones that are at the top give you younger ages, even though they're grossly inflated in a systematic way. So where relative ages of strata are not evident or cannot be determined from geological relationships, then radioisotopes may be a useful guide. And so if we've got an unknown rock, we can use it, date it by radioisotope dating, and then we can say, oh, that matches a rock in the Grand Canyon at this level with that same relative age in terms of its time during the flood. Why do I say that? Well, during the rate research, radioisotopes and age of the Earth, and I, I dealt with this in a, uh, earlier, we uncovered five independent lines of evidence, okay, systematically distorting radioactive ages. What do I mean by that? Well, the pattern we saw with the Cardenas basalt, remember we saw the argon age was younger, the potassium age was younger than the rubidium age, which is younger than the samarium age. We found that pattern repeated in other rock units, showing that there was something systematic going on, and that was decay rates were faster in the past. Also, helium diffusion indicated faster decay rates. Radio halos, fission tracks and radiocarbon. If you want to read up, go and read up the results of the rate research, which was finished in 2005, and it's freely available on the, on the internet. But, so that means that radioactive decay was grossly accelerated in a recent catastrophic geological event, especially during the flood. So think about it like this. A rock layer formed in the first month of the flood will accumulate 12 months of grossly accelerated radioactive decay. Whereas a rock that was erupted, a lava which was erupted in the last month of the flood, only has a month's worth of accumulated radioactive decay. 
So wouldn't you think the, the one that was erupted at the beginning of the flood would give you an older age than the one at the end of the flood? Yes, it would give you a, it would be a variance in the relative ages. And so you can understand why the deeper a volcanic layer in the geologic record, the more time for accelerated radioactive type, so the more daughter isotopes that will have accumulated during the flood year. So it will give you an older age, even though it's inaccurate, it will give you a relative way. So if, if someone came to you and, and you didn't know the ages, of the, or you didn't know where they came from in the Grand Canyon, but you got the radioactive ages, you'd know, oh, that one was early in the flood because it's got 600 million years worth of ra accelerated radioactive decay, whereas this one is only um, 10 million years old, so it must have come near the end of the flood because it didn't have much time to accumulate radioactive decay. So, these methods may often be a guide to relative ages because earlier and thus older strata would have experienced more accelerated decay and thus accelerated more daughter isotopes. Now another question we get is, what about all the short-lived isotopes that we don't see today? You often get thrown at that at you. The Earth must be billions of years old because there's missing short-lived radioisotopes today. Well, if you had accelerated decay, what would happen? They would have decayed away quickly at the beginning of that accelerated decay event and we wouldn't have them anymore today. So again, it's only more evidence that there has been an acceleration of decay in a catastrophic event in the past. So, if decay, rate, a decay acceleration factors for each of the long age parent-daughter isotope systems could be determined, then we could recalibrate if we had correction factors. I don't think we'll ever ever do be able to do that. But the point I want to make is we don't need to fear radiometric dating as a foe, but rather treat it as a friend, albeit as a tool to provide relative, not absolute ages. We have to remember that the millions and billions of years are an artefact of the assumptions that are wrong and unprovable and the decay rates that haven't been properly measured. Uh, but we know that, that those, those have been systematic and therefore we can still use as a guide for relative ages of strata. Well, why does all this matter? I like to always finish on a biblical note and bring it home to why this matters. You know, this, not, this is not just a scientific argument. There's something that's very crucial at the bottom at the end of the day on this. Jesus said in John 3, 12, I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you speak? It will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? Isn't that true? That's John 3.12. Four verses later he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you don't believe that earthly things he's telling you, how are you going to believe the gospel? Because you see, that's why it really matters. There can be no compromise on the age of the earth because the millions of years are based on an assumed, unobserved evolutionary history that is contrary to the explicit statements of God's word. Accept the millions of years and you undermine the gospel. Because why do we need a saviour? Because of what happened back there in Genesis. If Genesis isn't real literal history that we can trust, then why do we need a saviour? And that's why this age of the earth matters. If the Bible is unreliable about the earth's birth certificate, because that's what Genesis is, it's the birth certificate for the earth, then how can we trust John 3.16? Now, you all know that, otherwise you wouldn't be here, but we need to keep reminding ourselves that it's not about winning a scientific argument. Ultimately, it's a winning souls to Jesus Christ. Well, I just want to mention I brought resources with me, books, and that was because I also spoke at a church last night and I just mentioned a few of these so you can purchase them tonight. And we've got a special deal for you and I'm going to give you the same deal that I gave at the church last night. Why not? You're just as special as the people that were there. Uh, there's our answers book which have the most asked questions. There's even kids answers books. Dumb, uh, the level is down to answering questions, that, the same questions that the kids ask as, as parents do. Here's the special. Apart from a couple of items which are excluded because they're higher value, higher value items, 
You can choose three videos and get them for 35 or three books and get them for 35, three books and, and two videos and get them for 50. In other words, you can choose any combination and you will get them for those prices. And so you'll, you'll actually find that that's good, good value. Just to mention the lie evolution, which is Ken's famous book, which points out the importance of this issue. Coming to grips with Genesis, a study of why Genesis matters from the biblical aspects, theological aspects. We have a free newsletter out there and a sign-up sheet if you want it. A lot of this information has already been published in Answers magazine. And also, as Ken said, I'll come to our, man, our online technical journal. If you don't get Answers magazine, shame on you because a lot of the material I talk about in my presentations, I've actually put the written versions into these articles that are freely available in that magazine. Some of my videos, rock, strata, rock fossils and the flood, evidence of rapid fossilisation, recent rapid formation of coal and oil, the age of the earth, crucial compromises and critical assumptions of millions of years. There's some, a lot of material that I gave tonight is in that video there. Uh, circular reasoning in dating methods, that's primarily radiocarbon, um, tree ring dating and also VARBs or lake sediment dating is dealt with in that. Then there's a five, five videos which were recorded at a conference some years ago that are in this box set. You can, get them, you can get them individually or you can get them as a box set. So that's a special, that's a special deal in itself. And then there's my, my book, Earth's Catastrophic Past, two volume set. There's a story to that. Henry Morris wanted an update of the Genesis flood bite that he'd written with John Whitcomb and uh, he asked me to work on it after others didn't want to do it and it took a fair amount of time and ended up as a two volume. I gave it a different name because I didn't want to conflict with the, with the evergreen classic, The Genesis Flood. That's why it's got a different name. But it's an update of The Genesis Flood by Whitcomb and Morris because of all the new scientific information. And so it's a two pack, it's two volumes. And then there's our Answers Research Journal. That's free. You just click on our website and you can Get the, and notice you can download a PDF version, you can attach it to an email 24-7 and send it to anyone in the world free of charge. Our website, all that information is available to you to use as you need to. Okay, and that's, that's what we do as a ministry, try and make all this material available. Okay, back to Ken. I think we've got time for a short break and some questions. Wow. There's going to be a test, <laughs> but in a few minutes we're going to be testing him. <laughs> so we're going to have a question and answer time, but just before we do, a couple things. Uh, our meetings are free, but there are costs. To analyze rocks costs money. To bring rock analyzers costs money. I'm going to pass the basket around. We're going to have a word of prayer first as we pass it around sitting here thinking, when we came in here, we expected to be safe, and we've been safe tonight. A bunch of people went to church yesterday morning and expected to be safe, too. You know, as a pastor lost a significant portion of his congregation. Including his daughter. Let's think of those people as we have a word of prayer. Fathers, we come before you tonight. We are thankful that you are the sovereign God of the universe. That all things do work together for good even though at times we don't understand. There are times when you tell us not to understand, but just to trust. We pray for the people in Texas tonight, for those who have gone through this very difficult tragedy. And part of the reason as Christians we need to take the blame for it because as Christians we haven't spoken up, as churches we haven't done the job, as pastors we haven't been touching on these subjects We've allowed the culture to be politically correct. We've allowed the Bible to be removed from the schools, prayer and God, removed from these things. It's humorous to watch the talking heads at night trying to figure out how to put character back into our society. I remember one of our early presidents said, democracy doesn't work unless there's a strong religious fabric. And this whole undermining of the book of Genesis, the undermining of the Bible is really the cause. But we realize this is the end times as well that the way is narrow and few there be that find it. So our hearts go out to these people. 
but we're thankful to you that we are here tonight to hear these things. We're thankful for Dr. Snelling who's come. We're thankful that he was saved in a Christian home and a Christian church at the age of eight, that they were faithful and true to the book of Genesis, and that he's standing here tonight before us with the brains to explain some of this difficult stuff to us that supports your word because you've been faithful in his life, because his parents were faithful to him, because you're faithful. Thank you for being faithful to all of us. Thank you for everyone that's here tonight. Pray that you would give them a safe trip home after our meeting. Bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just a couple quick things before we dismiss. December 4th, Dan Michael, who's here with us tonight, is going to be talking about God's funniest yet vital proteins. I don't want to miss that. January and February open. Those are our winter months. I'm still negotiating with speakers for those two nights. It's, you have to promise snowshoes. <laughs> March, Russ Miller's coming. April 9th, Carl Kirby's coming. 9th is not, that's the second Monday, uh, because April 1st is both Easter and National Atheist Holiday. <laughs> Note on Carl Kirby, on April 7th, He's going to be have a, having a training session at the Field Museum. He likes to take groups and train them how to go through the exhibits at the Field Museum and share things with a, from a creation perspective. If you want to participate in something like that, check his website, check our website. It's new. It just happened. He just arranged it this week, so it's a new thing. But be watching for that. May 7th, Ron Dudek, who's a, a regular down at the Creation Museum talking about... Uh, Carnivorous plants is the word I was fishing for. It's good. A couple quick things. If you are new, come up and get one of these 15 reasons. On the Look on the chair in front of you, on the back of the chair in front of you. There are three red and yellow stickers. They're little guys about this size. If you find one of those, I have a copy of genetic entropy for you. If, somebody, if you find one that's green and yellow, I have Terry Mortensen's book on Adam. Now somebody may have their coat over it, so you may have to wait till I get up to look on the chair in front of me. Somebody's got to find it. Back up. Let's thank Dr. Snelling for coming. I'll be out of the book title if I want to talk. God's funniest protein. See you then.